Welcome to Speaking of Business, conversations with Canadian innovators, entrepreneurs, and business leaders. I'm Catherine Clark. On today's Speaking of Business Summer Special, I'm pleased wait, to- Wait, 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 wait. This is my show, Catherine. I'm the host. No way. Not today, Goldie. I'm asking the questions this time around. That's right, folks. Today, we're turning the tables on Goldie, who usually commands this podcast in his role as president and CEO of the Business Council of Canada. But today, Goldie's in the hot seat. Now, before taking on his current role, Goldie led Hill and Knowlton Strategies Canada. He served as chief of staff to a man I happen to know pretty well, my dad, the Right Honourable Joe Clark. We're going to chat about Goldie's childhood, the experiences that have shaped his life, his career, and also his views on leadership and Canada's role in the world. I hope that you'll enjoy this interview as much as I am looking forward to it. Goldie, I am so glad that you have agreed to do this or that your arm was firmly twisted into having to agree to do this. I'm looking forward to our conversation. I think I am too. (laughs) We'll see. (laughs) It's tough to have the tables turn. It's tough to be in another. I like that side of the table much better. The person I'd like to talk about first is your mom. And I wonder if you can tell us um, a little bit about your parents, but let's start with your mom first. You know, I've often said that I've been able to cherry pick the best of both my parents and see if I can. Somewhat like you've done, young lady. (laughs) Somewhat like you've done, knowing your parents. Uh, You know, you get get to see the good and the bad and the ugly of everybody, right? And in, in the case of my mom... You know, to me, I think the, the the lasting legacy is and will always be the values. She's resilient in her values and unrelenting about her view of the world, sometimes and often to a flaw, because the world isn't the way you construct it in your mind. It is what it is. But she has a decency to her value system uh, and a rigor that I admire um, grudgingly at times because I don't have that as much. Uh, I can be less forgiving, more of trying to construct the world in my view than, than just accepting it for what it kind of is. So I've often found that in her case, it's the value system. And when you look at life, your value system is not just you as an individual. How prominent is it in your life as a, in a business? for example, or the values of a country, you know, it extends uh, beyond just being an individual. So I give her full marks for that foundation. My dad always says, he said, you know, the the thing that you most want in your life is a good sleep. And he said, (laughs) and that comes from conscience, right? And if your conscience is clean and you're a good person and you're good, you know, you'll be able to get that sleep, no matter what adversity there is in your life, you'll get that sleep. And I've watched him do it for, you know, his 75 plus years. And I, and I hope to be able to do the same. What brought them to Canada? Uh, well, I guess it was both a push and a pull. In dad's case, in a country in which one had to play a game, and he was a you know, very successful journalist um, back in India, he essentially refused to kind of go along with some of the uh, things being asked of him in the journalist, you know, journalism industry, which he considered to be you know, not the reason he became a journalist. He came to report the news. And if the news had to be gerrymandered to someone else's liking, then it isn't the news anymore. And so he refused to do that. And, um, you know, it, it, a number of incidences, including uh, one in which uh, it did become about safety, where I was uh, riding my tricycle in my in my yard, in my garage there, in a shed, literally, and uh, the place was Molotov cocktail, and the things collapsed, and I fell, and I got a scratch on my head and all that. And my Grandmother basically told my father that day, if you can't stay here and I'm never going to watch this again, it happened to my, my grandson. So um, the pull became, there was already family here in Canada that mm-hmm. moved here uh, from, uh, from London and Toronto and pretty much everybody had ended up in Calgary, which I'm very happy for. And so we ended up immigrating directly to Calgary in uh, 1974. They came with $28 uh, in their pocket and, um, you know, did all the things I was telling my my daughter says, spend more time with your grandparents, learn what they've been through, because what you're going through today is a piece of cake compared to what, what they've been through. And, and what Calgary offered them was, um, uh, you know, obviously an opportunity to come and try and make a life. Uh, and they did. But it was at a time in which, you know, we were very much a minority. It was very noticeable. I would say racism, by definition, was very prevalent in your day to day life in some way, shape or, or form. I certainly experienced it. Calgary at that time, I think, was a bit of that stigma of the wild, wild west to some extent. But I do think there's a new Alberta, an Alberta that's much more pragmatic, much more centrist. 
I know from my family business that the people who've moved into Alberta, insurance is that business, but when people move to Alberta, they used to leave every time the economy went down. Mm -hmm. I'm told this time around that, that in fact, that's not happening, that people from Ontario and Newfoundland and, and Quebec and mm -hmm. others that have gone to Alberta have decided, I'm staying in Alberta. Right. And I think that's because this new Alberta is a welcoming Alberta. It really makes it um, uh, a great experiment worth being a part of. You were talking about the insurance business, which is the business that your dad Mom set and dad started, up. yeah. Yeah. Um, and they called it Link. They called it Link partly, as I understand it, because they really believed in the value of relationships. Correct. And they felt that relationships and business were a link. You really have personally carried that sense through in your own business and professional dealings in general. So it's, I mean, it's got to be effective. It is. Um, I mean, in my case, what I think I'm good at doing is connecting dots and connecting people. You know, that what you really want to be is a, is that connector mm -hmm. that brings people together. And I think it comes from, in part, the value system wanting to help um, I've always done what I can to make time for people who reach out to me uh, as young people. Hey, would you, would you meet with me? Would you have a coffee? Would you look at my CV or whatever? And to me, it's the pay it forward thing, but it's just an expansion of your networks. One more person that, you know, they may go on to something and you don't know, or they may go on and stay in touch with you or not, but you feel like you've done something to help someone else along the way. And I think it's just, as I said, pay it forward. Yeah. Why, um, given the intensity of the respect that you have for your parents, did you choose not to stay in the family business? Because you could have done. Uh, you no, probably were question. encouraged Sounds like you've been talking to my mom to and dad. So. Um, yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> well, look, um, you know, I'll be very candid. Um, you know, I'm very proud of what my parents have done. You know, started a business from scratch, built it from one file. And ironically, we just actually sold the business. Oh, my gosh. That must 40 have been so years. emotional. Yes. Um, you know, like any other business, it's ripe for disruption. So it was yeah. certainly time to get ahead of that disruption right. and uh, get your equity out. But uh, so I'm glad that that's occurred. But I watched a business build over 40 years. Uh, my parents had this one location. They ran it. I went in the business. I actually was a part of the business for about five years. To be honest, partly out of necessity, the economy had tanked in Alberta yeah. in 91. Um, you know, when I graduated from UFC with my master's, I was newly married. You know, we needed a job. And so I went Did into the family business. Did you expect that you were going to do that, though? I mean, like no. when you were at school. No, I mean, the grand plan was I'm going to go, I'm going to become a lawyer. You know, and that never happened. But when I was a kid, I wanted to be a pilot. So there's lots of things <laughs> in my life that never happened. Um, but I went in there and look, I'm a big believer in fate yeah. and a big believer in destiny. And so I'm like, okay, well, this is an opportunity. Let's see what it is. And, you know, it is the best five years of learning I ever had in my life. Why? Because I got to do an MBA in real life. I got to do it every day. The first thing my dad said to me when I walked into the office was, you're not my son in the office. And I looked at him and I thought, why are you being so mean? Like, what does that even mean? You don't, you don't want me to call you dad? He said, no, what I want you to realize is Link, the family business, is its own entity. We work for it. You are accountable for it. I'm not here to save you. If you don't perform, you're not here. You know, and I thought, wow, talk about a tough life lesson in hindsight. But man, am I ever glad he delivered that lesson to me that you have to earn everything that you get in life. Were you resentful? When he no, first said no, it? I was hurt. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. I was like, this is my hero. <laughs> it's the yeah. one I know. And so, you know, as is always the case, tough love, right? I mean, I remember that lesson more than I remember other lessons in part because it taught me a lot of important things. And people in my former employer at, uh, at Hill and Knowlton would have heard me quote my dad or mom or tell stories endlessly because it was a real life experience of how to run a business. You know, I mean, I would be like a 12 year old kid and we were all taught how to ask the right questions on a Sunday morning mm -hmm. because dad was sleeping right. still. Somebody saying, hey, I forgot to add my motor home. What's your serial number, sir? And, you know, so it was it was a great experience. But it was at the end of the day, I, I helped grow the business from one location to five. I learned about myself that I am a businessman. Right. I learned a lot during that time. But it was also not what I did. It, to me, it was still what mom and dad did. And I wanted to own something that could say I did it. Now, I also knew that I had a little brother whose passion it was okay. and is to okay. come into this business. He, he was into it from the time he was oh, a little are kid. Are you ever lucky, Gooley, yeah. that you had him? I had an insurance policy <laughs> called my little brother. <laughs> and you know what? He's much better at it than I am. Probably because he loves it. Well, his passion is right. there. He teaches me a thing or two I can tell you about relationships because he's got way more of my mom and me than I do. But he's really good at marketing, really good relationship builder. But he's also learned to be a really good 
businessman. And you combine those two things. Um, so I have no regrets about it. It was a great five years. I'm, yeah. and there's no question it was an informative period of my life. And for anybody who has to go into a family business, and we talk a lot on this podcast with a lot of people who've gone into family right. businesses, it's not easy. It's yeah. complicated. Did your dad and your mom ever face discrimination as they were setting up their business because they just didn't look or maybe sound like the other people around them? Or did they just keep that from you and not let that phase them? Uh, to be honest, I never heard them talk about that. Um, in fact, they, you know, my dad, uh, I, I kind of call him the Madonna of our, of our family because he goes by the name Hyder. He literally has one name, Hyder. <laughs> and it came from uh, the manager who hired him in the insurance business and said, you know, what a great name. People will remember you as high there, you know? And so, Perfect. yeah, and it just stuck. <laughs> it and stuck. so, so we, he's always been kind of known as Hyder. I mean, here's a guy who, you know, had done a bachelor of commerce and a bachelor of journalism, came to Canada, did everything every immigrant would do. You know, uh, he sold vacuum cleaners, he sold encyclopedias, uh, he sold life insurance, he did whatever he could. And then, and then one day someone basically gave him a break and said, look, we have a program you're going to learn how to sell insurance. You got to work for us for three years. The company was uh, still there called Travelers. And, uh, you know, dad went into the program. And in year one, I get to gloat a bit here because it's my dad. But year one was the rookie of the year in Canada. And That's we remarkable. were all flown to Montebello. Our first oh, wow. flight in Canada was to come <laughs> to Montebello at the time of Reagan and, uh, and, and um, uh, Maroney and all of that. So it was um, an incredible experience. And what it showed was that if you just work hard, you can overcome all of those things. I never heard them complain about those things. I felt it much more. I experienced it yeah. more. I have a scar on my hand here that I always remind myself of where. What happened? Know, I was um, in my grade three-ish, I think it was. And, um, you know, there was, a, as usual, somebody who was uh, bullying me or whatever the case might have been. And um, interestingly, he, he, you know, what would he know? But he called me a packy. Right. Which back then was sort of like the, you know, the four letter word yeah. for immigrants. Right. Packy. Well, I'm a really proud Indian. So this <laughs> went really deep to the core. I'm like, call me what you like, but don't call me that. Right. So with all respect to all my Pakistani friends, they know what I mean about that rivalry. It's kind of the U.S. Canada thing. Right. And uh, so, of course, when we got into a scuffle and um, then I realized as we were going through that, I thought, this kid's much bigger than me. It's probably a wise idea for me to run like heck. <laughs> And I did. And I proceeded to run as fast as I could with them chasing me. And the fence at the school was pointy at the top. And I got to get out of here. And I went to jump over that fence. And my hand went up on that fence and it just slid back uh, down and it was slid open uh, in half. There was blood and veins. And, you know, of course, everybody's now in awe of the blood and the veins. <laughs> and they're all gathering around for that reason. I don't remember you much were after safe that. On that front, then. Yeah, but suffice to say that you know, I, uh, these sixty-four stitches of which there's a very visible mark still, yeah. to me has always been um, uh, a reminder that um, first of all, I'm never going to let that happen to me again. I'm not going to run, right? I'm going to I'm going to fight for what is Canada, and that we um, have to work at this country. That you just don't get to uh, suppress other people or oppress them and or marginalize them. Uh, we have to work at it. And like, you know, those who know me will know that I, I am in love with Canada and it's the motivation I have for doing a lot of the things that I do. And this symbolism for me is one of um, never again, like should never happen to anybody. We should just be able to build a country uh, that doesn't ever have to live through that period. And it's sad where we are today in the world where that yeah, is, it really is popping itself right back up. Look yeah. what we're talking about in the United States yeah. each day. Can we jump to that then? Can we talk about, because you have had to continue that fight on a number of different fronts, including as a Muslim. And you have been very public about the fact that you are a proud Muslim and that the things you hear and see uh, really affect you in terms of anti-Muslim sentiment. But you've been very vocal about the fact that you are a proud Muslim and, and that the negative side is not one with which you identify. Can you talk about that also in terms of the Canada that you love? Well, um, you know, it's very personal, very deep for me. Uh, it's something I've thought a lot about. Uh, I think we're defined by events uh, in many ways in our life. This is one that I just spoke of now. Um, I, there's a part of me that thinks it's just our turn. 
that we've been through history where we've seen other uh, religions, other cultures experience what Muslims are are going through now. And it's just our turn. I often tell my friends of other faiths whose turn it hasn't been yet, be careful, <laughs> you're next, you know. Uh, and so we have to fight through it. One of the messages I give to young people when I meet them, particularly in this context, is to say, be who you are. All we know is we have one life, at least for certainty, we have one. I don't know if there's any more, but we have one. I don't want to live it on somebody else's terms. I want to live it on my terms. I want to live it to my fullest. And I don't want to be denied who I am. This is who I am. And so be who you are. And I think it's easy to preach that, but you got to show it. And so when 9-11 happened, I would say that was a defining moment as it was for many. You know, I had this epiphany that said, oh my God, I've kind of never really talked about being a Muslim. It's just a part of who I am, but it's almost been a secret part of whom I am, although it wasn't deliberate in that sense. Maybe I should talk about it more. And I remember talking to my dad <laughs> and uh, him saying to me, you know what, I love you to death, son, but I don't want you to do that. I, I don't think that's a good idea right now. It's not going to help you in your career. It's not going to help. I mean, as a father would, yeah. looked out for your best interest. What did you do? How, what was well, your reaction? Well, I listened reaction? to everything that he had to say. And I remember very specifically, I said to him, and I've talked about this before, uh, I love you to death, but I disagree with you, right? I have every intention of making it a point now, more naturally, not deliberately. I'm not a, a martyr of any kind. I'm like, just own who you are. This is a part of who I am. And so I, I took it upon myself at that time to, you know, opportunistically discuss as opposed to, so I'd throw in a line as a Muslim, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and people would be like, oh, well, that's a relevant line in this article, you know? And so it became like, oh, I never realized, I'll tell you a funny story. <laughs> uh, a former chief of staff to a prime minister whom I'd known for a very, very long time. When some incidences were taking place around this issue, I called in and I said, um, you know, look, I'm a little concerned as to the government's response to this issue. And um, I'd like to meet with you to talk about it. And he said to me, well, that's great, but why would you care? I said, well, because I'm a Muslim. He's like, what? <laughs> he said, I had no idea. I said, well, you've known me for like 10 years. <laughs> and it, then it hit me that this is a two way. I had never pointed it out. He'd never observed it. The name's not a dead giveaway for those who don't yeah, know. Sure. Is, uh, the Hyder is the Muslim mm -hmm. part of the name. The Goldie is not. But um, so it was interesting to me. And it was also a chance to know that, you know, you can have influence at critical times in the life of your country uh, if you own who you are. So um, you ended up in Ottawa which is probably, I'm thinking, was not on the Grand Radar no, scene um, at it, any point there's a, there was a bridge between ending up in Ottawa and leaving the family business, and it's how I met your dad, actually. Um, the professor at University of Calgary had started off a, a, what he called um, University College International. It was, a, it was an idea well ahead of its time. But what it was trying to do was provide academic and ancillary support services for full-paying international students. When you think about it, international students are you know, paying a lot of fees, but really, your, your client is the parent. Right. And, and they want to know that this child that's coming here is going to get a good education and not um, you know, get misguided and all that kind of stuff. And so this entity was being formed. And the professor um, at the University of Calgary who started it out, this person was an educator who really wasn't a business person. And I was a business and was like, how do the two of you get together? I read the spec that he provided me. And in that spec, which is a very detailed spec, was a board, which included the Right Honorable Joe Clark. And I kind of thought to myself when I read these names, which included you know, mayors, uh, you know, of a Bank of Canada board member, uh, you know, school board uh, you know, chair. I'm thinking, what do these people all know that I don't know? I should figure this out. And what I did was basically raise um, in partnership with my with the founder. We went out and put together a foundation of about half a million dollars worth of limited partnerships, mostly people who believed in me or him and or the idea. And so that was gratifying to say, wow, I can sell <laughs> this yeah. concept, which has nothing but paper to it. Uh, and so through that process, um, you know, I got to know your your father and others on the board. And then one day, and you're in this story, one day I'm sitting at home, you know, it's four years into this thing. It's not going great because the visas are just not being granted by the Department of Immigration, the levels at which we needed them. I'm frustrated. We weren't able to grow the project in Canada. So we were actually taking it out to India. We were trying to grow the project there. There were struggles with that. Your dad must have had a sixth sense because he phones. And I had just met him and your mom at a, at a barbecue at Heritage Park, I think it was, yeah. for a stampede or something. I and think I remember that barbecue. Yeah. You had a gold minivan. Yeah, you're right. I good know. job. Very, very good job. <laughs> that came all the way to Ottawa, by the way. Um, he called and I, I distinctly remember being in my home office and he said, Goldie, it's uh, Joe Clark. I stood up. 
<laughs> I do too. I, I stood up. <laughs> and I'm thinking like, why am I standing up as I'm doing it? And, I'm, and he said to me, it's uh, Joe Clark. And he said, and he got right to you, as you know, your father, right to the point. Um, do, you, um, I, I, do you have a CV? I said, well, to be candid, Mr. Clark, no. I went from my family business straight into this thing that I'm with. And so, no. He said, well, anyways, fax it to me. <laughs> okay. Right? And then he did. And I swear to God, he said, and he turned around because his voice went away a bit. And he said, Muff, oh, what's yeah. our fax number? Which, of course, is <laughs> my nickname. nickname for you, yeah. Muff. And you apparently gave him the fax number. And he gave me the fax number. And I'm jotting it all down. Of course, this is happening at a mile a minute. I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> we had just moved, just had our, our third child a few months earlier, um, who uh, turned out to be a special needs child. We were living in a home that we had built for the next 10 years, uh, completely, you know, all done and walkout basement, the little pond at the back on our neck. It was fantastic. We're done. And this call came. And so I sent it to him. And within a few days, uh, it was actually, it was my birthday. I was out for lunch with my dad sitting at, uh, at Earl's and the phone rings and the fellow says, hi, I'm such and such from uh, Joe Clark's uh, uh, office. And I'm, uh, I've been given your CV. Uh, I'm to hire you. I'm like, what? <laughs> for, Maybe I don't want to jump. Well, well for what? what? Is it? For, for starters, for what? <laughs> right? And it was a tough time, as you recall, yeah. for the progressive yes, conservative it was. party. And, but I was very much a progressive conservative. And I said to my dad, and I'm almost scared saying it, hey, dad, this call just happened fortuitously with you sitting in front of me. What do I do? And I remember him saying to me very distinctly, um, almost with a tear in his eye, because I think he saw this is, this is bye-bye for Goldie. Because all his friends would always say, you've got Goldie trapped in a cage. Let him fly. All right? And he'd be like, oh, I don't know if I can do that. And this is, was his calling. And now he said to me, he said, son, I'll tell you two things. He said, number one, my lesson in life is if you see everybody pursuing opportunity in one direction. And what he meant by that at that time was the Reform Party. Uh -huh. Right? He said, um, don't go there. Find your own path. Break free from that. And, and you'll find opportunity before they will. What a wise statement uh, at that time. The second thing he said to me was, um, and, and what's the worst thing that can happen? You fail, you come back and quote unquote with your tail between your legs and you can finally come back to the family business. <laughs> so good for him for being totally, totally honest, honest uh, about, the, about the situation. And uh, then I said to him, I said, all right, well, I'll go explore. And I came here thinking it was a job interview. It turned out to be more like a sales pitch as to why I should come to be the policy director at a time in which a major policy conference was being planned in uh, Quebec City. And uh, I went back to my parents. I said, look, there's an offer here. It's a pay cut. Um, I've got three kids, just built a house, have a mortgage. Um, it's all the way in Ottawa. We have nobody we know in Ottawa, no family, no, no friends of any kind. What do I do? And uh, he's like, go for it. Well, hang on though. What'd your wife say? Um, I think she was cool with it in the sense that I think she knew that I wanted to do something different. And, um, this would probably be a unique opportunity, you know, maybe a once in a lifetime opportunity and that, you know, she has a resilience about her and, uh, a, a deep rooted foundation that I can feed off of because I know that she's tough and can, can manage whatever challenges. And she's had to, she's had to manage a lot. I mean, mm -hmm. we, we did end up moving those kids that were zero, three and five yeah. to Ottawa. One of whom, as I said, was special needs was, you know, her first experience with Chio was a surgery, yeah. you know, and, and to manage um, uh, all of those things. So it was a tough, it was a tough call to that extent, but it was also one of those great lessons I talk about with young people saying, you know, first of all, in life, the moment chooses you, you don't get to choose it because this wasn't a convenient call. Right. Right. Uh, secondly, this whole notion of, well, it's a step back and it's a pay cut and I'm not in charge. I'm running this place and all of that stuff that you hear today. Yeah. Um, it was the right call because within six months, I became your dad's chief of staff at that time, you know, the youngest chief of staff, first Muslim chief of staff to a federal political leader, something, a badge I wear with great pride and made possible by, you know, him and his, his um, uh, view of life and his view of, and none of that mattered. I think, I don't think anybody cared what faith I was, but to me, it was rather important. And I never looked back. I mean, life has been fundamentally changed by that one phone call. <laughs> I'm a big believer also in this idea of um, following your instinct. That's a scary thing to do for a lot of people, though, because we get set in our ways and it's comfortable and it's safe and it's predictable. Do you tell people, take that risk, make that leap? Yeah. And I've given speeches on this post on my LinkedIn page about, uh, I think it is anyways, on risk for young people. I said, you know, when you think about it, we started this conversation about my parents who crossed a freaking ocean, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, without knowing what's on the other side. 
How will they make it work? $28 in their pocket, you know? And you want to talk about risk. Every day, people who are immigrating to this country from places from afar without knowing what they're coming to, without, and in some cases, not speaking proper language or whatever, they're having the proper education skills, and they're ready to believe in themselves, and they're ready to take that leap. And then you come across all this comfort in this country, and, and, and this is where I give a little tough love to Canada, <laughs> but... Boy, we, we are in some cases like those people who make those choices to not take those risks. As a country, we're very comfortable. We are complacent, comfortable because we have this great ally, we believe, you know, to the south of us. We have a good business partnership and a business relationship. So we, we have to take more risks. Now, they're not blind. You just don't leap. You have to take calculated risks. Um, let's be clear. The thought crossed my mind that I was joining a political party that yeah. was on life support. Right. It was losing an MP every, you know, every other month, it seemed like. It was not the wisest choice in life when you think about it. But I, I go back again to what I said. You got to be true to who you are. Be who you are. I'm proud of the fact that I can say I stuck through that entire journey when it was the most unpopular thing to do, to be a PC. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's, it's formative because people who know me know that what it means is I've tried to remain a centrist and tried to remain where most Canadians are. But some of that centrist approach that we have in Canada creates some of that comfort and that complacency. We haven't had a lot of adversity in this country, right? We need to face some challenges and, and take some risks. I think that applies to individuals and I think it also applies to Canada. You ended up after politics leading one of the country's largest communications and public relations organizations in Hill and Knowlton. And for full disclosure, um, that was my first job at Hill and Knowlton. Um, you know, There's years, a lot of people who say yeah. that. And I'm so <laughs> proud of that. <laughs> well, that's what a, a degree in art history will get you is uh, is begging for a job. No, I'm not so sure you need to worry about that as we look forward. You hear from my members, they really want people who can think. <laughs> so this is what I'm interested in asking. Having worked so intensely in the, the communications field and now leading a major organization whose function is to ensure that businesses can prosper and, and grow in this country, um, are you concerned about the communications abilities of young people who are coming up the ranks? Because one of the things that I observe is that we really put a focus on things like science and math, et cetera. And... Our kids, like my 13-year-old daughter is, her phone is implanted in her hand unless I, I yeah, say. Been there, like, done that. <laughs> right, exactly. So they're focusing more inwardly on their communication. I mean, it's, it has a, a much wider reach now because of social media. But they don't necessarily talk or answer the phone like you and I had to do as kids saying, hello, how are you today? May I take a message? I'm sorry, the person's not here, whatever. They don't have to do the things that we had to do. Um, does that worry you? Are you seeing... Uh, diminishing communications capacity in young people? And does that affect businesses? Boy, there's a lot to unpack there. Uh, <laughs> look, first of all, you know, when you mentioned the, the emphasis on science and, and, uh, and the math, et cetera, um, they call it STEM. I call it STEAM. Yes. You know, I think it, it, the A is a very important really, the, for, Which for stands arts. for arts. Yeah, yep. very important part of it. Um, one of the challenges, and you know, I've hired and fired MBAs. Um, it doesn't matter to me where you got your education, how smart you are. Can you do the job? And often can you do the job is how do you respond to adversity? How do you respond to change? We're actually in an era where storytelling matters a lot. We're in an era where creativity matters a lot. And so uh, my, my sense is that, um, and I, I guess it's more hope that these things, it's a pendulum. They swing hard one way. And they swing really hard another way. I don't know if your behavior has changed anyway with your PDA, but mine has. I mean, it was an addiction. It was, it was like I needed it every day. And I tell my kids, I said, I'm watching you and it may as well be a cigarette in your hand because I, I, I have to tell you to stop that. It's right. the same as a cigarette, right. right? And of course, you're the devil incarnate when you, when you do that to any of your children. But um, the pendulum swings. I've changed my own behavior to try and model it. It's had some impact in, in the home and not necessarily full, but but at least one of my children now charges their phones outside their room in the yeah. night that, because I started doing right. it, right? Because you know what? We just established our role too. Yeah. I mean, and so you're learning to find a balance because we we can't live in the extremes, you know? And I think that it's a journey that we're all on. 
for my members, though, uh, what I think it's about is, is first of all, there was this fear of millennials. Like, what do we do with these, mm-hmm. this group of people? Yeah, there's a lot of fear. About can't them. relate. Don't understand. <laughs> why don't they just yeah. come to work? Why are they asking me for a promotion six weeks into their job? Right. You know, like, and so we had to learn as leaders. We had to learn. And I will tell you, though, for all that talk about millennials, some of the great insights in my job, some of the learning that I had, some of the things that I actually changed in the company, it came from that group of people. So you can't just shut them off to say, oh, they're just kids. They're really smart kids. Yeah. And so we have to find, generations have to find uh, a way to find a, a much more happy medium to talk to each other. And I think part of it is how we lead. You know, um, leaders I know who are uncomfortable with social media are doing Google Hangouts now, are doing, you know, have their own Facebook page or are tweeting and, and directly as right. opposed to with some somebody else doing it for them. So they're they're making some steps towards the middle. And I think we want the other generation to come a little bit towards the middle as well. Yeah. And I guess that that's what it always comes down to, frankly, is meeting in the middle. So um, we've talked about communications in kids. We've talked about the idea of trusting your instincts and being open to um, new experiences. We've talked about the fact that millennials are a really different group of people and we have to to find a way to meet in the middle. What makes a good leader? What makes someone who can adapt to changing circumstances and uh, create a a situation where people want to collaborate and follow? Well, the short answer to that is use, you know, the two years more than you use your one mouth. I'm, I'm guilty at times of not doing that. I, I'm fully uh, mindful of that. But I, every time I have been able to get things right, it's come from doing, as I said, sitting down with people, listening to what it is that they're saying. I think uh, leaders who lead by example are the best leaders. You know, never ask someone to do what you wouldn't do yourself. And I think, again, there's a great lesson from my family business. My dad would often say, who do you think is going to take out that garbage? <laughs> it's our business. It's going to be one of us, you know? And so you learn quickly about the dignity of labor and you learn that uh, leadership is about, you know, being on the field as much as it is just, you know, kind of um, uh, coaching from the sidelines. Is there um, a specific example from your own life that has helped inform your idea of what leadership really means? When I look at uh, and I listen to so many of my members talk on this podcast, one of the common themes that emerges as to what makes a good leader, aside from perseverance, I think, is uh, dealing with adversity, dealing with failure. Uh, I look back at, uh, at a, what I would consider as a very formative event in my life. It was very early in life, thankfully, uh, high school, grade 12-ish. I had uh, a summer job where, um, you know, as a part of a, an effort to help change the perception of young people in our community in Calgary at that time, there's a lot of vandalism and things like that. And I was hired to basically put together a conference that was going to create a forum for young people to talk with civic leaders and police and others. And up until that time, I had not experienced failure, really. To, in fact, I was a really lucky kid. A um, lot of things that I was a part of, uh, both as teams and as individuals, led to championships, led to being, you know, on the winner's circle or on the podium. And so I hadn't really experienced much failure or much adversity. And winning felt like it just kind of happens. Like this is, this is, this is what your life is about. You're going to be a winner. And then this conference gets uh, organized and my job was to make sure that there were people at it, you know? And so I'm out there, you know, uh, to be honest, uh, putting in 50% of the effort, you know, I put up some posters, uh, made sure there was a commercial on the radio and surely to goodness, that's all it takes to get 150 people into a gymnasium in a summer afternoon. Well, it turns out it takes more than that. And, you know, at the the day of the event, 25 people show up and there's like these 125 empty chairs. And I am like disgusted with myself. I'm angry. I'm disappointed. I'm hurt. But a facade is being put up in front about how, well, you know, I did everything I could. Right. But I knew I didn't. And that taught me, first of all, I never want to feel that way ever again is what I thought that day. And I'm fortunate. I don't think I've ever had to, but it taught me two things. One is nothing comes to you. I don't care who you are. You got to work for it. You have to work for it. Number one. And number two, you got to have a plan. You absolutely have to have a plan. And, you know, I, I'm, and a lot of people say, you know, you do strategy, don't talk strategy. I believe in that. But I always tell people, do not, like, I always have a strategy. You know, even when it came to the need to move to Ottawa, in my mind, I was thinking about the step after. Where would that go? What could it possibly be if I, you know, like, so you're always thinking about what is the right strategy. And ultimately, that is a big part of leadership. People are looking to you 
to be ahead of them. You know, uh, it's at this point in time, we're taping this in July here. It's about this point in time where I tell my staff, uh, I'm now in, I'm in the next year. I have left you. I'm no longer with you. You're going to finish off the year. You're going to do what you need to do because I'm there. And the reason is you got to get ready and prepare for what that strategy is going to be. And I think a lot of leaders uh, that I've uh, tried to emulate and I've seen, that's where that notion of visionary comes from, being able to look ahead. I have to talk about just really quickly something else that was probably a, um, you know, a seminal moment in your life. I understand that your dad had you, despite the fact that you lived in Calgary, cheer for the Edmonton Oilers. <laughs> when you immigrate to a country, you don't know all their local battles, right? And so we arrived in, in Alberta. Um, Wayne Gretzky actually cut the ribbon uh, for the inauguration of our family business because he was doing commercials for our parent company at that time. And so on our website, or was on our website, is a photo of Wayne when, when uh, he was there. And um, so this was a high for my dad and my brother who cheered for the Edmonton Oilers. And I grew up a Calgary Flames fan thinking that this was an important thing to do. And uh, so suffice to say, there was a lot of painful moments in my home. Um, but those hockey fans will know my best comeback has always been the word Steve Smith, the guy who scored on his own goal that gave us the chance to move forward. Strangely, though, I will confess, I grew up an Edmonton Eskimos fan. And again, that was one of those great examples where... You know, people say, why would you do that? Well, one is I didn't have the, the rivalry, you know, appreciation for the rivalry. But, you know, the real reason was they had a quarterback named Warren Moon. And at that time, to have a quarterback of African-American descent was unheard of. Right? And there is this guy I could look to and say, oh, I can see opportunity and hope for myself. And so something else I think a lot of us reflect on is we have to give kids hope. And we have to give the next generation hope and make sure that they can see themselves in that. And I think a lot of businesses have become very sensitive uh, to that, which is a good thing. Just a couple more questions. And one has to do with your current role, because we're in an environment now where um, there are so many tensions. I mean, globally, politically, um, there's a growing gap between uh, rich and poor issues of climate change, trade disputes. How are you feeling about this role that um, you now have leading the Business Council of Canada. Are you optimistic? Are you concerned? Uh, what are you feeling right now? You know, I want to say I'm optimistic, Catherine, because I'd like to be optimistic, but I am concerned. Uh, I'm genuinely concerned uh, for the well-being of, of our country in the sense that this cultural trait of being comfortable and, and somewhat cocky <laughs> about being better than so many other places in the world has led us to a malaise, uh, has led us to a place where just because something lasted for 152 years, the resiliency of these things now is no longer a guarantee. I mean, brand name companies that are icons in Canada have come and gone, you know, come and gone. Nothing lasts forever anymore. You have to work at it. You have to work hard at it. And I think that requires a reality check. Government after government, of course, it's their duty to tell you all the great things that they've done. And yes, there's a lot of great things that consecutive governments, concurrent governments over time have done going back, you know, from my time here in Canada, lots of achievements from the Charter of Rights to balancing the budgets and, you know, dealing with the deficit issue and, and uh, you know, trying to make some headway in our social programs. I get, I get all of that. But countries, you know, need to think about themselves to some extent as uh, they, they compete. They compete for talent. They compete for capital. And in a marketplace where the competition is getting better, we have to be alert to what that means for us. You know, I was, um, uh, I get a chance to attend a lot of conferences and things. And one of the conferences I attended, there was this notion of so what somebody called the Asianization of Asia. And I said, well, that's an interesting phrase. And what they meant by that was, there's a sense that we are doing Asia a favor by engaging with it, that it is the quote unquote, you know, emerging market. Well, kind of know your history. Um, they're probably a re-emerging market. They've been around like 5,000 years. They've been under different ownership. <laughs> different people have led it along the way, but they're hardly emerging. We are the toddler in the marketplace. We're like 152 years old with a neighbor 300 plus years old. We're the ones who are trying to make sense of how to be influential in the world and how to compete in the world. And this notion of they have the people, they have their own internet, they have their own pay systems, you know, they have their own initiatives that they're making locally to build an infrastructure that allows them to just basically focus on, their, on themselves. We need to get into that market. We need to compete in that market. We can do it 
consistent with our values, because I think this is the great struggle that everybody's faced. Your father was arguably, if not the certainly top, you know, external affairs ministers this country's ever seen. He did it for a long time and he managed adversity in other countries where we had disagreements with their political ideologies, with their value bases and so forth, but found a way to navigate that as have consecutive foreign ministers. These days we're seen to be a bit more moralizing than perhaps we've been in the past. And that can come back and bite you if you don't realize your place in the world and your place in the world is your Canada. Okay. Like you're, you're punching above your weight. We've been a blessed country to be where we are. As things change, we may not be in the G7 or the G8 or the G20. And maybe that doesn't matter, but I think it does. We need to compete. We are not going to get by on what got us here. We have demographic pressures coming at us. We you know, sure do. In a very big way. And mm-hmm. so right now at a time in which people are debating whether we should have immigration or not, you're like going, hang on a minute here. It's a disconnect. One of the reasons the unemployment rate is as low as it is in the last 40 years is because our population is aged and is not looking for work. Statistics can be interpreted in different ways. Right. And yet we have a job shortage. Yeah. And so every person that has a vacant job today is a person not paying taxes for your roads, your health care, your education. And we need honesty in our conversations at a time in which I think our politics, sadly, is becoming polarized. And it's it's a victim as much as it is an architect of social media, the tribalism that we're seeing. And there's a vacuum uh, where I think still most Canadians reside. And what we're trying to do at the Business Council is seize the baton of leadership, because I think our members have a credibility now. Ironically, driven in part by the very thing that's destroyed leadership in politics, social media, has actually emboldened leadership in business because we've been able to get out of our shells. Mm -hmm. You know, the the days of a CEO arriving in a limo, going into its own elevator to its own penthouse, you know, floor and sending out a command and control edict of what will happen. They're gone. Thank God. That's not the best way to run the company. And I'm sure many people didn't do it that way, but that's the perception. Now you're engaged. You can provide leadership. And our people are looking. Canadians are looking for leaders. And they can find them in different walks of life. And it doesn't always have to be in politics. But unfortunately, politics is where our laws are made, mm-hmm. where our regulations are made, mm-hmm. where our global brand are, yeah. is, is, is impacted. And so we need more good people to seek public office for that reason. I want to end by asking about your girls. So you have three girls. What do you want to see for them? You know, <laughs> If there's a great shortcoming I feel in my own life is I just, I've never felt that I've been a good dad. And um, I'm hoping that all the things that they've gotten from their mom uh, stays with them. That they're able to um, see what determination is, that they're able to see what um, perseverance is, that they're able to see how to manage adversity, uh, how to battle through hard work. And that if they get one thing from me, it is that notion of be who you are. Uh, go for it. Go and do what you want to do. Be who you want to be. Um, I'm very blessed. I've got great, great kids. They're, um, you know, uh, very mature for for their age and for some of the things that they've had to deal with. Uh, they keep me honest, as I know you did your father. Uh, you know, they can say things that other people don't say. Uh, and I think that, um, you know, what you want for them is what, um, you know, I think any parent would want for their child, right? Which is, you know, be able to do what you want to do in your life, be able to uh, set goals and, and, and achieve them. Uh, you know, I have a motto, uh, be good, do good, and good will come back at you. And if it doesn't, that's okay. You'll still feel good. And I'm hoping that they'll be able to live by that. You know, it's interesting to hear you say that because I think a lot of times we assume that being a good parent means being a super present parent. Yeah. I and know. I wonder if that's the part that you're worried about because that's not what kids necessarily no, remember. I know, you know, and I, I'm, look, I've interviewed many CEOs and um, they've said the same thing, you know, my shortcoming, my failure. And I think you're right. The part of it is, is that is the time, you know, um, in a strange way, social media has been a gift because I'm always on with my kids. Right. You know, nobody will know if I'm texting them right now. Sure. Um, so you're at least feeling like you're accessible, you're available and you're there. But no, it's a great guilt of mine that I, I can do better as a dad. And I know many other CEOs that feel that way or, and or as a mom. Uh, and yeah, part of it is the time thing. I think the secret is to find the quality as opposed to the quantity. Yeah. Um, you know, many CEOs I've spoken to like me have said, okay, I made it a point to like, okay, that's locked in. 
that's a graduation. Yeah. That's a key soccer final. That's a key, you know, event in the child's life or it's a medical appointment, you know, um, and it's, it's natural. I mean, you've got more than one kid now, right? But I mean, you kind of look back and go, boy, I sure did a lot with number one, yeah. <laughs> right? And then number two, a little less. And by the time you hit number three, you're like, well, I'll get there one if I, if I can do it, honey. But you got it, right, dear? <laughs> so it's tough. It's tough. Yeah, but it's a lasting example that you've left for them. And uh, it's been such a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much, Thank Goldie. you, Catherine. Thanks again to Goldie Hyder for being my guest on this special Turn the Tables episode of Speaking of Business. I'm Catherine Clark. Catherine, thank you for doing this. I really appreciate it. Before we wrap up, let me remind everyone that we'll be back in the fall with more conversations with Canada's top innovators, entrepreneurs, and business leaders. You won't want to miss a single episode of Season 2, so subscribe now in your favorite podcast app. Or visit speakingofbiz.ca to join our mailing list and catch up on Season 1. Until next time, I'm Goldie Hyder.